August 13th, 2022. I spent the day with my mom, Fort Bragg. It's her birthday today. Went early. We had breakfast together. Went for a walk. Had the meal together. Went for another walk. Very nice to spend time together, have good conversations, some good Dhamma conversation, spending time with my parents. Good uh, reflections, thinking about supporting parents. This is always uh, something that's lifted up in Buddhism is supporting parents, I think, any tradition of Buddhism. And certainly the Buddha in the Pali Canon praises this practice of staying in contact with parents, supporting parents. Gratitude to parents. There's these reflections that some people might feel like, well, my parents, I don't have any gratitude to my parents. They, they mistreated me. So that may be true, that may be the case. Yet, certainly that wasn't the case with my parents, but sometimes, yes, that may be the case for some people. But even then, at least there was that point when you were first born, looked after by parents, you were completely helpless. So your parents looked after you. At least they did that good thing for you, looked after you when you're completely helpless and brought you into the world. Our parents, with the help of our parents, we learn how to walk, how to speak. We have to learn these skills very early on. We have to have somebody teach them to us. That's usually our parents. So just those two things, walking and speaking, are quite important to be able to do to function in the world. So even just that, even if we just think of that, you know, we can have, we can cultivate some sort of appreciation and gratitude. So thinking about some different Dhamma qualities, how to, how to practice, how to think about the practice. One thing I've been thinking about is this definition of this word Sakaya Ditti that we talk about. We talk about the first stage of awakening, Sotapanna, stream entry. We talk about three things falling away, Sakaya Ditti, Silabhata Bharamasa and Vichikicha. Sakaya Ditti is normally translated as personality belief. Silabhata Bharamasa normally translated as attachment or clinging to rites and rituals. And Vichikicha, doubt, is normally translated as a doubt. Those three, three things fall away if one reaches stream entry or the first stage of awakening as it's laid out in the Pali Canon. And so we can contemplate these terms and try to figure out what they actually mean and on a feeling level or on an experience level, what is Sakaya Titi, what is Sila Bhattaparamasa, what is Vichikicha. And Sakaya Ditti, personality, belief, and I'm thinking, oh, that's kind of, it's always, kind of unclear what it is. It's, it's a little bit like, well, is it, uh, what is it exactly? So I, I thought of a, 
for myself, I use a different translation. I translate it as persona. Persona, yes, I find that more helpful in terms of understanding Sakaya Diti because persona is something we create and we're, it, it's always changing, so we might, have to, we might want to have a certain persona around certain people, or at certain times we might have a different persona. So we might have a persona of me being the teacher, I might have a persona of being a monk, or trying to be a good monk, or having a persona of being someone who is strict or having a persona of being someone who is suffering all the time, being a, cultivating a persona of someone who is just totally laid back all the time. That can be a persona as well, not that being totally laid back all the time is a bad thing. It's a good thing, but uh, we, it can make, we can make a persona out of it. Not fitting in can be a persona. I'm the one who doesn't fit in. So, or whatever we, we can get creative with whatever personas we can think of that we've may, maybe cultivated before in the past. So it's something that's created. And when we create a persona or we have a persona you know, or we try to prop up some sort of persona, then we suffer over it. So it, it causes suffering. Or want to be seen in a certain way. So it's quite interesting how we do this. And it's also interesting to think that that's something that falls away at the time of stream entry. So what is it like if that thing falls away? Who are we? Sometimes we might try to, try to create a persona of trying to be a good person. So we can think of Sakaya Ditti as trying to be somebody, trying to be a good person, trying to be a good monk, trying to be a good meditator, trying to be a good practitioner, trying to be anything at all, trying to be a bodhisattva, trying to be an arhant. That's persona. So that's Sakaya Ditti. And when that falls away, oh, what a relief. Don't have to be anything. Just get on with things. So very simple, but it's too basic. It's too easy. It's too easy, too basic. So we might think, well, I have to, if I'm practicing, I have to be working really hard at something. But then usually what we're working really hard at as creating this persona is propping up the Sakaya Ditti, creating it, making it stronger. And so we don't yet have right view, we don't yet understand. So if we're still practicing with ignorance, then when we're practicing, we're actually strengthening and cultivating further Sakaya Ditti rather than letting go of it. We might have some good meditation experiences and we might even have some modicum of happiness. But if we're still cultivating that persona, then we're slightly moving in the wrong direction, so we have to be careful. Then there's Sila Bhatta Paramasa that can be translated as attachment to rites and rituals, attachment to precepts and practices. And so we might hear that and think, well, we shouldn't do chanting, we shouldn't do bowing, we shouldn't do all these things because that's attachment to precepts and practices. But when we think about this, it's more attachment to precepts and practices coupled with wrong view. So thinking that chanting in and of itself is going to liberate us, thinking that bowing in and of itself is going to liberate us, thinking of keeping the precepts in and of themselves is going to be what liberates us, thinking of doing a certain mantra is what's going to liberate us in and of itself, that's Silabhata Paramasa. Thinking that not bowing in and of itself is going to liberate us, thinking that not chanting in and of itself is going to liberate us, those, are also, those things are also Silabhata Paramasa. So thinking that some external condition is going to liberate us in and of itself 
is in its, in its essence that sila bhatta bharamasa attachment to precepts and practices. If I do it this way, that'll be liberating. If I don't chant, if I don't bow, if I don't have Buddha images, that'll be liberating in and of itself. So that's sila bhatta bharamasa. Or if I, if I just do so many bows, or if I just do this, so many, this chant so many times, so we have to know what these things are for, and the chanting and the bowing and all of these things are for bringing up energy, for reestablishing mindfulness. The, the bowing is for, and doing the bowing well, the chanting and doing the chanting well, these are for reestablishing mindfulness. They're, they're for cultivating these internal qualities which help us to see these things much more clearly. So knowing what they're for, everything that we're doing, knowing what it's for. So when the Buddha taught, he didn't just say, do this because I said so, because I'm the Buddha. Like, how dare you question me? I'm the, I'm the Buddha. I mean, how can you question what I tell you? Like, uh, so the Buddha, when he was questioned, he always said why he taught something. He always gave the reasons for it. He didn't just say, well, because I said to do it, you should do it. Just shut up and, and do it. He actually gave reasons when people asked him, why do you do this? Why do you do that? He always gave a reason for it. When he said, why do we have this precept? He always gave a reason for it. Why do we have the fifth, fifth precept? Why can't we drink? Well, it's the basis for negligence. It'll cause you to break all the other precepts. So he, he gives a reason. He doesn't just say, because I said so, or because I'm the authority figure. That's why you should do it. But he always gives a reason. Sometimes he would tell stories to illustrate his, that reason. Sometimes he would give analogies to illustrate why we should do certain things, why we shouldn't do other things. Very, very patient and compassionate. So when the Buddha said to do certain things, it was because it led to more happiness and less suffering. When he said to refrain from other things, it was because it led to more happiness and less suffering. When he said you should do this, it's because it's for our benefit, for our well-being. He says we shouldn't do something else it's for our benefit, for our well-being. So the Buddha is very wise, very patient, very compassionate. And if we don't understand why we need to do something, why we do something in the monastery, why do we do it this way, or this seems strange, why do we do this thing, we can, we're, you're welcome to ask about it. And then uh, hopefully nobody tells you, well, just because I said so, I'm the Ajahn. Do what I say, because I said so. I don't have to give you a reason. So that ideally that is not the case. So uh, if someone asks why, why we do something, hopefully I don't say that. Hopefully I say, well, it's because of this reason. There is this particular benefit of doing this particular action, being this particular way. So sila bhatta bharamasa is thinking these actions are going to liberate in and of themselves. And so we'd have to realize or look into what they're actually for, for cultivating mindfulness, bringing up energy. And then vijikicha is an interesting one because it's translated as a doubt, but the Buddha describes it in a couple different ways, perhaps a few different ways in the Pali Canon and suttas. And one way to understand that, that per, this perhaps the more common way is to say, well, you no longer have doubt in Buddha Dhamma Sangha. You no longer have doubt in the awakening of the Buddha. So that's the, perhaps the more common understanding, but also the Buddha in many places describes this doubt that falls away as one is no longer perplexed about wholesome and unwholesome states. So one no longer has doubt about right and wrong. One no longer has doubt about what leads to suffering and what leads to happiness. Uh, so that's perhaps, in my mind, that's perhaps more relevant that you no longer doubt what's right, what's wrong, what's beneficial, what's harmful. Uh, one's no longer perplexed. Is this the right thing? Is this kind of uh, frozen with indecision about what's right and wrong? So one gains the what Lungpurpasana would call a Dhamma compass, where, where you actually know what's wholesome and unwholesome. And you know, you have a feeling for it, you have an 
intuitive sense for it about what's wholesome and unwholesome. So it's said that somebody who is a stream enterer can still break some of the precepts, and, but they'll, they'll feel like they have to reveal it right away. They won't be able to hide it. They won't be able to keep it a secret. They'll have to reveal it right away. They'll feel compelled that they have to say, oh, you know, they know, they know it was wrong. They have to, it's not that they never do wrong things, but they, they know what's right and wrong. They know, oh, that was a, that was something, that was a blunder, that was a transgression. I'm going to let somebody know about that and have that sense or that inner fire for training, wanting to cultivate and keep moving in the right direction. For example, uh, my thought about this is not, not having that type of doubt. For example, anger is an easy example. So you would have no doubt that anger causes suffering every single time. It's never in the past brought well-being to ourselves. It doesn't currently and it never will, so there's no doubt about that. It's not that one still might not get, one still might get irritated or angry, but there's no doubt that, oh, that, that burns the mind every single time and uh, doesn't bring benefit. So you catch it much quicker and that's incredibly helpful to, uh, and, and the Buddha talks about, uh, say, in the Dhammachaka Sutta, Anya Kondanya, attaining stream entry at the end of that sutta, but the way he attained stream entry, it wasn't from contemplating Sakaya Ditti, Sila Bhatta Bharamasa, and Vichy Kicha. It wasn't from directly contemplating those three things, the persona, thinking conditions, certain conditions will liberate us in and of themselves, and doubt, perplexity about wholesome and unwholesome states. It wasn't that thinking about those three particular things or directly was what caused those three things to fall away for Anya Kondanya, but it was through an insight into impermanence. So we keep coming back to that. And perhaps that's another way to see doubt is that the doubt that fell away for him was everything that arises passes away and is not self. And then there was no doubt about that. So perhaps that's another way to see Vichikichi, see that, that type of doubt that falls away. So everything that arises, both physical and mental, absolutely everything is impermanent. Every dhamma, every uh, condition, every condition that arises passes away. So seeing that impermanence that say Anya Kondanya reached stream entry or open the eye of Dhamma. So that, that's what's said at the end of the Dhamma Chakapuatana Sutta and that's very important. The Buddha says, oh, he, he understands. He understood the teaching. So, so that makes us say, okay, well, we need to look into this impermanence, this anichang. What is this that the Buddha is pointing to? Because Everybody knows, at least intellectually, that all things, or at least most things, are impermanent. That's, that's easy. So why aren't we liberated? Why aren't we enlightened? Why aren't there more enlightened people in the world? So if everybody knows things are impermanent. So it's because we haven't internalized it in a very deep way. And so it hasn't uprooted our attachment and clinging because we haven't internalized it in a very deep way. So when we contemplate anichang or impermanence, it's, and seeing it on a very deep level is things that are rising and, and things are always in flux. We th when we think about impermanence, maybe in a regular or normal way, we might think of okay, something arises, it lasts for a while, and it passes away. 
And yet the word anichang on a very deep level is pointing to flux or constant motion so that something arising means something else is passing away. Arising, passing away, arising, passing away. These are actually the same thing. So there's constant change. Con it's not, not constant even for a moment. So one, per one translation perhaps preferred for that is the Ajahn Jeff translation of inconstancy. Inconstancy, rather than impermanence, inconstancy. Nothing is constant. It's just everything is in motion all the time. And our, our bodies, our minds, they're always changing all the time. Not static, even for an instant. They're changing all the time. And then the big change that the Buddha is pointing to is, is death. So the big unknown, the big change that can happen at any time for anyone is, is death. And so there's this attachment, this clinging, wanting things to be a certain way, wanting to protect ourselves, wanting to protect others. That's, that's not a bad thing. But we have a lot of fear, a lot of hope and fear around, around this thing that we call death. So we have to look into what is this impermanence and what is this trying to trying to make things fixed. So if, if there's this inconstancy, how do we, what is our, how much work is our mind doing to try to fix things to be a certain way according to our desires? And how much effort do we spend? How much suffering do we experience over just trying to do that? Just trying to fix things, just trying to, we got to put things in the Google calendar. It's got to be a certain way. It's got to, and uh, again, it's not to say don't use a Google Calendar, but it's uh, to learn how to be flexible and okay if things change, when things change, because they will. So being able to be flexible, malleable with our plans, being open to new directions all the time, being open to new ways of doing things, uh, being open to just seeing if... Uh, some new way of seeing something is presented, then open to looking into it. So, because normally, say, if we just look into the mind, views and opinions, they tend to be fairly rigid, fairly fixed. Uh, so it's, uh, when the Buddha talks about samadhi, when the Buddha talks about sama samadhi or right meditation, he talks about getting to a point where the mind is wieldy, malleable, fit for work. So it's, it's flexible, it's focused, but it's, it's very flexible, steady, yet malleable. So it, can be, it can be formed malleable. The translation for malleable in Thai is quite interesting. It's a, it's a word that, that uh, means it flows into any container. That's the Thai word for, for malleable. It can be cast into any shape. It can flow into any container. It's, it doesn't have to be fixed. Uh, so that's, that's ripe for insight, for the cultivation of discernment or panya, wisdom. So I guess looping back around to uh, gratitude to parents, uh, we can see that that's a wholesome state. We don't have to have any doubt about that, or at least just gratitude in and of, in and of itself. The word is katanyu katawedi. So uh, that cultivation of gratitude or that focusing on things that cause gratitude. Sometimes we have a tendency to focus on what we don't have, the meditation attainments we don't have, the enlightenment that we don't have, the achievements that we don't have. Sometimes we tend to focus on that and the mind can get tight or negative. So to cultivate katanyu katawedi, we can, cultivate, we can focus on what we have, what we've already achieved, what we've been given, and the precepts we've already followed for a long time. We can cultivate gratitude 
when we reflect on these things and not necessarily actually cultivate gratitude but it's something that arises when we focus on the positive focus on what we've had what we have what we've been given and the opportunities that we've had in in the practice so we can focus on that and katanya katawedi or gratitude is a is a natural would arise in a natural way based on focusing on those positives so trying to steer the mind away from the negative and, and into the positive. So uh, I think that's about, about it for this evening. And I'll just leave it there because uh, that's about all that's coming up. And it's Saturday. Yesterday was the Lunar Observance Day. So, uh, so today is, is normally an open day, and I think uh, sometimes a, a short talk is easier to internalize, easier to remember, so I'll leave it there.